thank you for having me here. I'm very um, glad to be able to, to present this, uh, to present the FireGen project, especially in my home uh, country. Um, and it's, uh, I find it also interesting to be to take the ethical parts of it, because uh, I'm a researcher and normally I'm just working with data. So this is a really a different perspective that I have to take and and um, think about. So, but before we go into, I'll just um, introduce you to the population. Uh, the Faroese population is 18 islands. Uh, a middle of nowhere, and uh, we have uh, currently 50,000 people, no, 52,000 people, and it's growing, uh, luckily. Um, from mitochondria DNA and um, Y chromosome, we can see that if we can look at where the first people, where the original people, or the founders uh, came from, and uh, we can see that the ma men w uh, predominantly uh, are Vikings, while the women are of Celtic origin. So, um, and what's re also really important when you have this a, a, a population like this, an isolated founded population, is uh, the population growth. Uh, because we can see, uh, there has actually been, uh, okay, this graph is really bad, but you can see that um, at the y-x, you have uh, the centuries. And you can see that the population size have been really stable for centuries, about, about 5,000 people. But then in the uh, 18th century, it started to grow, or, or 19th century actually. For, for, so it's from about uh, 150 years, it has grown from 5,000 to these 50,000. And this is uh, really good for um, population genetics uh, because of it drives. Uh, some of this variation, genetic variation that we uh, have, uh, drives it to uh, greater uh, frequencies. So you can think that if the founder population had like a, a group or, or um, oh, I'm always very nervous the first two <laughs> minutes. So, um, yeah. So we, we, you could think that that the founder population, about maybe 500 people, when they came, they had a limited number of genetic variants with them. And if you uh, then um, um, breed on this uh, variation and, and only uh, without getting new inf uh, genetics uh, into the pools, uh, then you, you, will c you will see that some of the variants that were rare in the, founder in, in the larger population become enriched or higher frequency. And this is actually what we see with some of the diseases that I will show you afterwards. So this is really important for using this population for genetics and healthcare research at all. Um, and that's why uh, in 2007, uh, the Biobank was established. Uh, a, a it's under, uh, coordinated within the health sector in the Faroe Island. And it has these three registries, the tissue registry with different samples, um, yeah, biopsies, uh, blood spots and, and, and blood samples. And then we have the genealogy, a really detailed genealogy going back to the 17th century. And actually about um, almost 90% of the population has data going back to the 7th century. So this is really um, um, like a gold mine uh, for research to be able to link all the individuals and to, and to sh look into uh, when, when we talk about healthcare uh, research. And then we have uh, the, the diagnosis registry where we have the possibility to go into different databases of uh, with diagnosis and if we look at this um, um, table here you can see that we have the genetic diseases and have, uh, um, above we have the monogenetic diseases and then we have complex genetic uh, genetic diseases and especially when we look at the monogenetic diseases we can see that we have a high frequency for example this uh, uh, carnitine transporter deficiency it's, we actually have the highest number in the, in the world. Uh, for you can see the world uh, from uh, uh, the prevalence in, in the world compared to the prevalence in the Faroe Islands. So we can see that some of these diseases are really frequent. And this is due to the founder effect. So overall, we can see this is really good for, <laughs> again, for, for doing research. Um, however, when we do research in a small society like the Faroe Islands, um, we have both the research perspective, but also the individuals. 
and we have to remember that because it's really uh, easy to go, oh, we have all this, it's like a gold mine, and we hold, have all this data, how can we connect it? And from a, res from a researcher, I find this really exciting and a good possibility. But I have to remember there, there are individuals um, part of this, and it's the risk of stigmatization, social control by use of this data. Uh, for example, we have this, um, uh, this disease in the Faroe Islands, kind of doing uh, the CDD disease, and the variant that was identified has actually become, <laughs> have, uh, bec have uh, when we talk like daily, uh, it has like the name of the uh, island where it was most frequent found. And that is really, I think, could be really stigmatizing. So would people really enjoy, uh, would, uh, <laughs> try to be in a project like this? If, if uh, yeah, so you, you can understand. So we have to really think about things. And I think one thing we could do is to engage people. And that's what we try to do in the Farchin project, that we, wh what we have done is we go out to the different areas around the islands and talk about the project, uh, tell them what, it, what it's all about, and really engaging them to, to, to ask questions and really, yeah, any questions, to, to, just to, be, to get the trust of people and to, uh, to share what we, uh, we would like to do so nothing is uh, um, like, um, uh, not known for them. And what, would we, what we would, uh, really would like to do that is the information could empower the individuals so that we could say that that information coming from this research, because we have the possibilities that we are so close related and everybody knows each other, um, but this information about disease variants could also, also about the risk of disease, uh, could help people to, yeah, and to empower them by the knowledge that, okay, life, life change, uh, lifestyles uh, changes, who could uh, go into that uh, um, discussion. So. So I think that will be really good uh, for us to be able to balance this, uh, the research part, but also with how, how we could involve people and, and, and empower them with this knowledge that we get uh, using this population. So, uh, so what is Fargen? Um, yeah, it is a project uh, conducted by the Genetic Biobank. Um, and what we want to do is do an infrastructure. So if you look at this, uh, up here, we see the fire chain infrastructure, and what we are generating is exome or genome data. And the purpose is that we use it for genetic research, either as uh, we look into families because we have the genealogy, or we look at more population like case controls. And the idea is that the information that we get from the research could go back to the healthcare system in order to initiate precision medicine. So, um, so both that we have the data, uh, like in a database that the doctors can use to get, the, like by uh, both by helping them to decide which medicine to use, what uh, how what kind of doses dosage to use. Um, but we also, of course, it's a, a really a, um, a struggle for us to to see how can we get this genetic data from research back to the healthcare system because I think there's also the, the we have to have a debate on what is. Uh, how, how to um, organize that. Okay, so before we started uh, the Fortune project in 2016, it was started long before that, but we started recruiting in 2016, and we did a survey asking people, what do you think about the project? Uh, should we start doing this? And we were really happy to see that most people who were asked said, oh, it's a good idea. And then we asked them, um, would you like to participate if, when we start this project? And we're also really happy to see that almost 75% of the people would like to, may or would like to participate. So that's a really good start point for us. Um, so when we started recruiting, uh, what was really important also from the scientific advisory board side was that we, the, uh, the people were, um, we had to volunteer, uh, they had to voluntarily join the project. So meaning that we have this huge biobank with a lot of data, no, a lot of samples, but we couldn't go get, uh, use the old samples. We have to go out uh, and asking for new samples. That was really important. And, and it's also part of this engaging people and, uh, in, you know, so that people know what's going on and we're not doing anything that um, they're not do, well, knowing, know of. Um, and we did that by doing uh, TV commercials 
and also again really important that we uh, had a scientific um, uh, line um, uh, for it and not using like a, p a pathos saying that oh it's really you should join this project and and because it's really good for you know this information would go, go, be good for like uh, for um, future generations so we were not allowed to go out like that it should be really strict scientific so that was um, a really good um, learning also in uh, being part of this project and and then we have this uh, homepage the bad uh, the picture is really uh, bad <laughs> um <laughs> i'm really a uh, color <laughs> Uh, but you can go in, in the, and to sign, so it says Tekna Tittelfargen, sign up for Fargen. So you put your name and your email, uh, and then you'll get the information about the project. And, what is, and this is uh, a lot of different information, but what's really important here is that we, we are supposed to give them genetic counselling before and of course after. But what is, is challenging is to, is to give uh, a genetic counselling before we... Um, we started the project because we couldn't go in and do classic uh, counseling. So what we did is to go and tell, uh, so mainly about the project, but what was really important to tell them about these incidental findings. And I'll come into that af li later. Yeah. And they asked, uh, they, we had this questionnaire about different things. Of course, many of these things we get from registries. But what's also interesting, we asked them what motivate them to participate. And I'll give you the results uh, in a while. Uh, in the consent form, um, they were being told that we will perform whole genome sequencing. Uh, they will be part of the reference genome. And, and what's really important that there's no broad consent, meaning they'll only give consent to those two things, being part of it, that they were sequencing, and being part of the reference genome. So it means that uh, data, w we'll, we're constructing a uh, uh, infrastructure with, for research. But if, if researchers are going to use this project for different uh, uh, purpose, they, uh, people have to be asked again. So, of course, from a research perspective, this is really a struggle. But I think it's really important for the participants that this is uh, how we do it, especially uh, in a small, si uh, small um, scale community. And, and it's uh, important that they, are, they, are be, they have uh, this possibility to opt out at any time without any reason. So we don't give feedback to the participants, but I said, as I told you, that we, have a, we tell them about incidental findings. And it's only when a finding, and, and this means that we're finding something that we weren't actually looking for. For example, it could be like a BRCA mutation. Uh, and when we know that the BRCA mutation, the information really could help uh, women or and men uh, by, for example, for example, genetic counseling, um, then it's th this information will come back to the participants. Yeah, and future studies will give uh, will they have to decide on what to give on, but then the individuals will be told again about what feedback they will get from each different. Uh, project. So we started and the aim was to get 1500 samples and we got 2000 individuals joining, uh, like signing up and we uh, have uh, reached the goal of getting these 1500 samples, a good start off. And we see here that the female are more obliged to participate. And if we look at this graph here, we can see the islands and that the, the central area of the islands are more represented compared to other places. So this is again, even though if it, we have like a short distance uh, to, and we, uh, we're happy about that, we still see that maybe we lack to get really out uh, and, and yeah, should get, um, do more work on getting all the individuals or, or yeah, more uh, evenly represented. Um, so again, we, we asked about their motivation for participating and then we have different questions. For example, development of research skills in the Faroe Islands. Is this important for you, for you to participate? And, uh, or is it important for you to participate because you're helping others, this information could help others? And so on. Um, and this is, yeah, the number speaks for itself, so it's really interesting to see that that, the, the, that we are developing um, research skills and doing the project here in the Faroe Islands is actually um, 
weighs more than their knowledge about their own genes. So of course it could be that people are not actually just not actually interested in getting the information. They're just interested in that this is going to be done, and that the information in in the end will help, like uh, like uh, humankind. <laughs> so yeah, so this is interesting and and. And then we asked them about their participation in research project. Would they would they be obliged to participate? And almost yeah, like ev all want to participate in, in in some kind of research. So that's really, really good. Um, yeah. So um, the Fargen, um project, as I told you, is an infrastructure. So you can see in the middle. And the, the, uh, the goal is to get the data out to different projects. So this is actually projects that already are using FireGen project or have got a permission from the ethical board to use FireGen, uh, FireGen um, data. So the individual have been asked again, can you, will you participate? And mostly we have uh, used uh, the FireGen uh, uh, population as control samples for, for example, IBD and HDHD. Um, because doctors, they will, uh, will have their own cohorts that they recruit to the hospitals, and then they can have uh, like a, pop uh, uh, a comparison population using the Fargen project. So that's uh, like the purpose with the projects. So it's really good. And what we want to do next is to recruit even more uh, samples. Yeah. Uh, will the next goal will be, and we actually have got the ethical permission to go for 5,000 samples and also recruit more uh, uh, data, meaning um, not just for, for genetics, but also for microbiome, um, for uh, biochemistry and hematology, uh, uh, yeah, and, um, and also taking measurements, different measurements, like, uh, um, yeah, uh, tra they could train or, or stay on a way to get their, I uh, yeah, just the general health status of the, yeah, so, yeah, so what have I learned or what can be learned from using a small scale population or community? Well, we see that what, we, what is also really interesting is that people are generally really interested in being part of a research. So we don't really see that what I've read about, for example, other um, indigenous, uh, I can't pronounce the word, <laughs> indigenous uh, populations where, um, where they might feel like it's uh, like ki some kind of biocolonization. Uh, and that's really interesting that we don't see that, maybe because we're actually really late on doing research in the Faroe Islands. Uh, so, yeah, so all the regulations are already there. So that could be one of the reasons. Um, and what I found also really interesting from my own perspective is that because I've, I've been working as a researcher in Denmark, in Aarhus, and when I'm also working with this population, and it never struck my mind about the people behind the data. It was just data, and I, I worked with it, and I found it interesting. I was actually looking at panic disorder, and to see if we have some genes for panic disorder. And, and when I moved back and working at the biobank, it was like, oh, people are suddenly really close. And I'm, on, uh, uh, I'm uh, part of recruiting the individuals and, and getting in and, and also the blood samples and getting the data. So it's, uh, suddenly it's really close and, and you see that it's not just data, it's really real people behind it. So I, I, I couldn't, I, I've learned that from <laughs> working from us with a small scale uh, community. And of course the importance of trust, I think it's, it's really important here, more important, especially, I mean, um, um, as when you work with it, you meet people again, and it's uh, yeah, you talk to people. I actually, if I'm a, a personal, I actually just the other day I met this guy in in the supermarket, and he looked at me, and he almost looked away, and he said, "Oh, you always give me so bad conscience because I really want to join your project, but I never find the time." <laughs> 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 so I was like, "Oh no, do I give that people that <laughs> impression?" So yeah. <laughs> um, and also this, the participants really expect uh, interventions from the results. Uh, because as a researcher working in a huge um, university, it's, you're, it's all about the getting the knowledge. You're, I don't know, if, if I've especially had it like that. It's about the knowledge and not so much about 
uh, getting the data back to the individuals because, yeah, I don't know, maybe because I, I, I wasn't uh, aware of it. Uh, yeah, but that's what I've, I find it. Uh, now I meet people and they're asking, what, what, how is it going? When will we know? And when will we get this precision medicine? And it's like, ooh, yeah, it's, it's close by. So I think it's a, um, a huge responsibility. I feel that more than, uh, <laughs> than I have used to. Um, but also I think it's really important to be clear of what we're doing that re results from research is not the same as results from the clinic, even though we're doing health research. Um, I think it's a huge difference and we have to be aware of that uh, also in, in teaching people what's the difference that the goal of doing research compared to the clinic. So, yeah, that's... And then, of course, also the privacy. Uh, it's, uh, pr uh, respect for privacy is uh, one thing for if, if it applies for everybody, but I think when, you sm when you're in a small community, uh, it gets more obvious. So, thank you for listening and thank you for the committee. <laughs>